Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I'm showing you the world's fastest Intel Alchemist GPU clocked at a little bit above 3.5 gigahertz. For that, obviously, I use liquid nitrogen and the Elmo Labs EVC2 SE. In this video, I show you also how I managed to get P1 in all the 3D Mark benchmarks, at least for the A77 category, and I'll share all the tricks you need to know for a successful extreme overclocking session with the ARC A770. All right, let's jump in. In preparation for this video, I finished a scatterbencher guide demonstrating how to overclock this Intel ARC A770 GPU. At the end of that video, I said that we pretty much worked around all the artificial limitations on the A770. And that was really a prerequisite to even begin considering extreme overclocking with this card. I also want to give a quick shout out to Reddit user Unbounded. I thought I'd be the first one to try liquid nitrogen on an Intel Arc card, but he did it first and shared the experience at length on Reddit about two months ago. After finishing the Scatterbencher overclocking guide, I pinged Elmore from Elmore Labs to see if I could spend a day at his office for an LN2 overclocking session. I'm sure you're thinking by now, why do you want to overclock Intel Alchemist with liquid nitrogen? Well, first and foremost, I'm Scatterbencher, so I want to know every chip's potential performance. Secondly, this is also Intel's first foray in discrete graphics in a very long time. So it would be interesting to find out how far we can push their design when temperature and voltage are not a constraint. In addition, it's also interesting to see how the TSMC in 6 process scales with elevated voltages and sub-zero temperatures. The main objective of this video was to have a legitimate claim to the title of world's fastest alchemist GPU. And for that, I need two data points. One, obviously having the highest frequency ever recorded. And then two, I also wanted to have a P1 in a competitive benchmark. The first target is to get the highest frequency in GPU-Z regardless of the load. The second target is achieving the highest frequency in a light workload. I picked Fermark GPU stress test with 50 by 50 pixels as the light workload. For the benchmark objective, I downloaded all 10 available 3D Mark workloads and then sorted them by number of submissions with the Arc A770 graphics card. My main objective was to achieve P1 in the top three most used benchmarks, but if there's time and nitrogen left, I'd also try the others. The most used benchmark with the ARC A770 is TimeSpy and the target score to beat was 16,415 by BrutusCat2, who had the card run at an average frequency of 2,800 MHz. Next up is preparing the system, and that immediately got a lot more convoluted than I had hoped. The usual process for GPU overclocking involves picking up a GPU LN2 container like the Kingpin Cooling Tech 9. Unfortunately, the ARC A770 has quite odd mounting holes, and there's no mounting bracket available for any commonly available GPU LN2 container. Fortunately, Elmore had an interesting 90 degree PCIe riser at his office, making it extremely easy to lay the GPU flat and use the Elmore Labs Volcano LN2 container. To protect the GPU die, I added two layers of protective tape around the die. Additionally, using a GPU cooler isn't ideal because it has no GPU mounting bracket. So we must rely on Mother Nature's mounting force, gravity. The last thing to sort out is the insulation around the PCIe area. Basic insulation sufficed because I wasn't planning on running the card for too long and too cold. In addition to the Volcano and into container, I also used other Elmo Labs gear. I used the EVC2 SE to program the voltage controller over the I2C interface. I also used the Elmo Labs KTH USB to read out the LN2 container temperature and monitor it using the software. The point of this video is not just to show off the results, but also help you understand the limitations of Intel Alchemist when it comes to extreme overclocking. There are five main limitations that you need to know about. I cover the ins and outs of these limitations in my Scatterbencher overclocking guide at length. Here I'll try to keep the explanations as brief and concise as possible. By default, the ARC GPUs rely on a factory-fused voltage frequency curve to adjust the boost frequency dynamically. 
However, we want to precisely control the effective GPU frequency during extreme overclocking sessions. Unfortunately, those controls are not available in the ARC control software. However, in the summer of 2022, when the ARC A-series GPUs had just become available, with the help of Shamino, we built the ARC OC tool, which offers a simple interface to access the GPU overclocking toolkit available via the publicly available Intel Graphics Control Library, or IGCL. A vital benefit of the ARC OC tool is exposing the OC lock feature. With OC lock, you can set a specific operating voltage and frequency. So we can set the frequency as high as we need to. The 228 watt total board power limit is the first bottleneck when overclocking the Intel Arc A770, even on ambient cooling. The power limit on the A770 is the total board power, meaning all the power of all components on the graphics card. The GPU manages the power limit in two steps. First, the voltage controller provides information about the output power to the GPU, then the GPU enforces the limit through software. You can override the power limit in two ways. First, you can use the Acer Predator Bifrost software application and trick the profiles into applying higher power limits. You can also program the voltage controller to report lower than actual power consumption to the GPU. Here's the process to increase the power limit using the Predator Bifrost software. First, open the Predator Bifrost software, create a new profile, then close the software. Now browse to App Data, Roaming, Predator Bifrost presets, and open the settings file. Now look for your custom profile and change the power limit value to anything you want really. Make sure to save the file. Then open the Acer Predator Bifrost software again and activate your custom profile. You can verify with hardware info that the power limits were set correctly. To determine how to program the voltage regulator to report lower power, we must look closer at the voltage regulation design. The GPU is powered by a six-phase design managed by Monolithic Power Systems, MPS, MP2979 Digital Multiphase Voltage Controller. This controller drives six Monolithic MP86956 70 amps IntelliPhase DRMOS, one for each phase. The hardware modification adds an I2C pin header on the graphics card PCB, allowing us to communicate directly with the onboard digital voltage controller. We can then connect the EVC2SE device to the I2C pins to control the voltage regulator. The relevant function to adjust the power limit is called I-out gain. By lowering the programmed value, this function allows us to skew the reported output current by a specific factor. So we can use it to have the voltage controller report to the GPU that it's using much lower power than it actually uses. The voltage limit and throttle are separate issues that can be resolved with one solution. When we set the voltage using OC lock, the set voltage is offset by about plus 215 millivolt. So if you set one volt in the software, the actual voltage would be around 1.215 volt. In addition, there is a limit to how high you can program the voltage. Any OC lock value over 1.1 volt or about 1.295 volt actual voltage doesn't work. So we're limited to a maximum voltage of 1.295 volt. Next, the GPU also imposes an artificial voltage performance throttler as the GPU automatically reduces the operating frequency when the voltage exceeds a certain threshold. On the A770, this GPU frequency throttling mechanism kicks in when the set voltage is over 1.2 volts. We can solve both issues by switching the voltage regulator control mode from ISVID to PM bus. In ISVID mode, the voltage controller adjusts the output voltage based on the GPU request. The GPU relies on its factory-fused voltage frequency curve to determine the appropriate voltage at any given moment. In PM bus mode, we program the voltage controller output voltage directly without interference from the GPU. Thus, we can set any voltage over 1.2 volt. The last performance limiter on this card is the VRM temperature. As I highlighted in my ARC A770 overclocking guide, the VRM design with six power stages gets in real trouble when the power consumption exceeds 330 watts. When the VRM temperature hits 110 degrees Celsius, it reduces the GPU clock to its base frequency of 2.1 GHz. This won't be great when we use higher voltage with liquid nitrogen. 
The junction temperature of the DRMOS power stages is 150 degrees Celsius, and the voltage controller's over temperature protection is set accordingly at 150 degrees Celsius. However, the voltage controller's maximum temperature is set to 115 degrees Celsius. When this temperature is reached, the VR hot asserts. VR hot is one of the many protections safeguarding your graphics card. It is a required signal from the voltage regulator to the chip, informing the chip that the VRM temperature is too high. In that case, the chip will throttle its frequency to ensure protection. So we can provide additional thermal headroom by adjusting the voltage controller's VR hot threshold. Alternatively, you can design a better thermal solution for your card's VRM. Maybe you can even use a liquid nitrogen container, just like South African overclocker Vivi did to qualify for the MSI MOA 2013 finals. All right, before we jump to the results, let me quickly go over the potential challenges that we are anticipating, as well as some of the expectations that we have for our extreme overclocking session. The first and most obvious challenge will be the VRM capability. As I mentioned already, the six DRMOS power stages get in trouble when the card's using over 330 watt. On water cooling, that happens when the voltage is around one volt. Lower temperatures also lower the power consumption at the same voltage due to reduced leakage current, but we know that the VRM will eventually become a limitation. When it comes to the cold bug, meaning the temperature at which the GPU stops operating, we're truly in uncharted territory. We have no idea what the GPU and the memory can take in terms of temperature. For what it's worth, Many extreme overclockers nowadays use GPU heaters to keep the memory at positive temperatures, as they're incapable of running at low temperatures. The overclocking session started well as we were running 3 Mark Time Spy within an hour at 3 GHz. However, the 3 Mark Time Spy benchmark performance was poor, scoring less than 16,000 points. That was miles away from our target. The performance of 3D Mark Port Royal, a ray tracing benchmark, was even worse, only 7,500 points, far from the 8,200 points we needed for P1. What was going on? In hindsight, the poor performance result had an obvious root cause. Maybe you can spot it? But as is typical for an extreme overclocking session, it took hours to figure out what happened. So what was the root cause? Well, the GPU was running at PCIe Gen 4 by 1. Turns out that this particular CPU had some PCIe problems. So when we swapped it out for another Raptor Lake CPU, we could finally run PCIe Gen 4 by 16. And then the good results came in fast. Now, I have a lot of results to share with you, so I'll go in order of GPU frequency. The highest frequency I achieved with Alchemist was 3586 megahertz with 1.305 volt. The LN2 container temperature was minus 80 degrees Celsius and the GPU temperature was about minus 50 degrees Celsius. The card was very unstable at this point. While I could idle a couple of seconds at this frequency, eventually the screen would lock up and a reboot was required. The highest frequency during a light workload was 3,400 megahertz with 1.285 volt. The LN2 container temperature was minus 70 degrees Celsius and the GPU temperature was about minus 30 degrees Celsius. Despite running Fermark GPU stress test with only 50 by 50 pixels, the power consumption was more than 170 watt. The highest frequency during a 3D Mark benchmark was 3.1 GHz, though unfortunately I could never complete a Time Spy benchmark. Well, that's not entirely true. I was able to complete a Time Spy benchmark once, but I had forgotten to extend the VRM temperature limit. So during the benchmark, the card sometimes throttled to 2.1 GHz when the VRM hit 110 degrees Celsius, resulting in a poor benchmark result. The highest frequency to complete a 3D Mark benchmark was 3012 MHz with 1.12 volts. The container temperature was about minus 50 degrees Celsius and the GPU temperature was minus 30 degrees Celsius. I needed this frequency to get P1 in the 3D Mark Night Raid benchmark. Speaking of the 3D Mark benchmarks, I managed to sweep P1 in all but one of the 10 3D Mark benchmarks. I also achieved this with a 3 GHz GPU clock 
making it a nice, neat milestone. I'll leave the links to the 3D Mark results in the description below. It may surprise you, but I also ran and passed the Speedway stress test at 3 GHz to learn the limits of this GPU. The voltage was 1.114 volt. The GPU temperature was minus 20 degrees Celsius with an LN2 container base temperature of minus 44 degrees Celsius. The VRM temperature was 85 degrees Celsius and surprisingly, the memory temperature was 71 degrees Celsius. The total GPU power was 258.404 watts. So I achieved the highest frequency ever on Alchemist and took P1 on pretty much all of the benchmarks. Is there anything left in the tank? Yes, I think so. As I mentioned several times, the VRM is the main bottleneck for this card. Other ARC A770 cards on the market with an 8-phase VRM design may be better suited for chasing performance records. Additionally, there's always the option to zombify the graphics card by soldering an external VRM to the card. The GPU would also benefit from better mounting, and it shouldn't be challenging to do better than this gravity-reliant mechanism. You can control the GPU temperature better and maybe fine-tune for the optimal voltage with a better mounting. Lastly, to be honest, I'm pretty mediocre at GPU extreme overclocking, and I ran out of talent quite quickly. I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there that can take this Alchemist GPU even further than what I was able to do. I just hope that with sharing the information and the tools to work around all of the limitations, those much more skilled people can go ahead and try to find the limits of the Intel Alchemist GPU. All right, let's wrap this up. I think it's pretty obvious from this video that I'm very satisfied with the outcome of this project. The first important milestone was to figure out the workarounds for all of the artificial limitations holding back the performance of the ARC A770. And we achieved that in our Scatterbencher guide. Check. The second milestone was to achieve the highest possible frequency on the Intel ARC GPU. And we hit over 3.5 gigahertz with liquid nitrogen. Now, I remember a couple of years ago that the industry was raving about AMD hitting 3.3 gigahertz on RDNA 2. So for Intel's first modern discrete graphics to hit over 3.5 gigahertz, I think that's nothing short of impressive. I hope that with all the tools and the information out there now, how to have a successful uh, Intel Arc extreme overclocking session, the more experienced and the more talented extreme overclockers will be able to push this card to its absolute limit. Anyway, that's it for this video. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank the patrons for their support. And also I want to thank Elmo Labs for his hospitality and hosting me in his office. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and see you next time.